El día de hoy vamos a empezar con una de mis personas favoritas con que amo y adoro hablar. Creo que él también ama y adora hablar conmigo. Ahorita le voy a preguntar. Pero seguramente muchos de ustedes han oído de Tal Ben Rajar, que es autor y conferencista. Enseñaba el curso más popular en la Universidad de Harvard sobre psicología positiva. Es especialista en liderazgo, en felicidad, en autoestima, en resiliencia, en establecimiento de metas. Su último libro es Atajos hacia la felicidad, lecciones que me cambiaron la vida, que aprendí de mi peluquero, que es una joya. Se llama Shortcuts to Happiness, Life Changing Lessons from My Barber. Es el cofundador y director de aprendizaje de la Academia de, Estado, de Estudios de la Felicidad, Happiness Studies Academy. Y eh, justamente les tenemos una felicidad porque los vamos a invitar a algo de, de tal próximamente. Pero le doy la bienvenida porque hoy vamos a hablar de lo que estamos buscando todo el mundo, todos los días en la vida. Y son las cinco poderosas claves para alcanzar la felicidad. Ahora, quiero que me confiesen en Twitter, ¿quién de ustedes puede decir con la mano en el corazón en la Biblia donde se les dé la gana que son felices? My dear Tal, welcome back to the show. I told everybody that you're one of my favorite people to talk to. Thank you, Marta. And I'm so glad we're uh, meeting again. I hope the next time we'll be in person, though. Absolutely. Next time it yeah. has to be in person. So where are you physically? Uh, New Jersey. You're just, in New uh, Jersey. Just north of New York City. Great, great. Well, welcome to the show. So I was telling everybody that happiness is something that we think we are pursuing every day. But many times it's not even like a conscious act or a conscious decision. You're mm. just like living your life, going to work, operating and resolving problems and issues and, you know, trying to pull through the day and survive the day and the month and the year. We don't consciously think, I need to do things to be happy. I need to protect my happiness. I mm. need to promote my happiness. Would you say? Yeah, you know, you bring up um, a very important point, um, which actually has to do with one of the most significant barriers to happiness. Because when people are not conscious of the things that they need to do to becoming happier, they actually become less happy. And, 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 I, and I want to explain through uh, uh, some research that was done recently. So it was shown that people who simply wake up in the morning and say, I choose to be happy or happiness is really important for me or I'm going to pursue happiness, they end up being less happy. Now, that's a problem because on the one hand, we know happiness is good, right? We want to be happy. We want our loved ones to be happy. Uh, there are many um, benefits to happiness. And yet, if we put it on our uh, list of goals as a key goal, that is a problem. So what do we do? How do we pursue happiness? And the answer to this is that we need to pursue happiness indirectly. And here is an analogy. Let's say um, we go out um, into the world and the sun is shining and we look at the sun. Looking at the sun directly will hurt our eyes. However, if we take the sun and we break it using a prism, for example, And then we look at the colors of the rainbow. Then we can enjoy it. In other words, looking at the sun indirectly helps. Looking at it directly hurts. And it's the same with happiness. Just resolving to be happy, looking at it directly will make us less happy. We need to indirectly pursue happiness. Now, what does okay, that look like? Right Now, I want to understand what indirectly looking for happiness looks like. So let me say all this in Spanish. Good. Le digo que la felicidad es algo que en teoría estamos buscando todos, todos los días. No estoy segura que todos, de manera consciente, todos los días, todas las semanas, todos los meses, todos los años, estamos conscientes eh, de que esa es la meta. Me dijo, es que tocas un tema súper, súper importante. 
Miren, está comprobado en estudios que los que creen que levantarse en la mañana y decir hoy voy a ser feliz, hoy voy a estar contento, funciona y no, no funciona. De hecho, les voy a dar una analogía perfecta. Uno sale un día soleado. Si tú volteas a ver al sol directamente, te lastima los ojos. Pero si agarras un prisma y dejas que el sol refleje la luz y entonces se hace un arco iris y eso es lo que ves, eso hace muy bien. Y es lo mismo que pasa con la felicidad. La felicidad la tienes que buscar indirectamente. Y no crean que con decir todos los días, voy a ser feliz, voy a estar feliz, voy a hacerme el propósito de hoy estar contento, es una buena estrategia. Y no es así. La felicidad se tiene que buscar de manera indirecta. Ahora, lo que le digo es que quiero entender cómo se busca. Entonces, what do you mean when you say happiness needs to be looked for in an indirect way? Yeah. So, just as we know what looking at the sun in an indirect way means, that is, the colors of the rainbow, we need to understand what these colors of the rainbow are for happiness. In other words, what are the elements, the components of happiness? And for that, we need to understand and define it. So one way, this is the, what I've chosen to define happiness, is happiness is comprising five different elements. These are sort of the colors of the rainbow okay. of happiness. These five elements are spiritual well-being, physical well-being, intellectual well-being, relational well-being, and finally, emotional well-being. So in order to be happy, you have to have all these five elements covered. Well, what you need to do is think about each one of these elements and ask, how can I pursue that? Because if I pursue spiritual well-being or physical well-being or intellectual or relational or emotional well-being, then what I'm doing is I'm pursuing happiness indirectly. Now, do we need them all? Throughout life, yes, but not all the time and not to the same degree. Okay. Ok, so let me say that in Spanish. A ver, dice, mira, ya que entendimos el concepto de que lo que te hace feliz no es directamente ver al sol, sino lo que el sol produce, pensemos en un arco iris, para entender este concepto de que la felicidad se busca de manera indirecta, tendrías que entender, ok, ¿de qué está compuesto el arco iris? ¿De qué está compuesta la felicidad? Y lo que él ha definido como los componentes que ayudan a una persona a ser feliz son cinco co cosas muy puntuales. El bienestar espiritual, el bienestar físico, el bienestar intelectual, el bienestar relacional y el bienestar emocional. Ahora, esto no significa que todas las vas a usar al mismo tiempo ni en el mismo grado pero sí son cinco cosas que vas a requerir a través de tu vida. Got that down. Great. So um, let me actually go over uh, each one of them and, uh, and maybe discuss some of the ways in which we can Absolutely. indirectly pursue okay. Okay. happiness. Okay. So let's begin with spiritual well-being. Now, spiritual well-being, of course, can be uh, experienced through religion. So when I go to, um, you know, to church or, or synagogue or a mosque, I experience spirituality. When I connect to the community, connect to God, that's spirituality. At the same time, we can also experience spirituality outside of religion. How? Through experiencing a sense of meaning and purpose in our life. So if uh, the work that I do, whether it's as a Um, you know, in, 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 in journalism or in teaching or in business or in, in medicine or in teaching. If I can find meaning in my work, I'm experiencing my work spiritually. That is spiritual well-being. 
or of course experience uh, meaning in my relationships. That's spiritual mm-hmm. well-being. That's one way. Another way of experiencing spiritual well-being is through uh, being present, being mindful. Mm-hmm. You know, if I go for a walk uh, in nature and I truly am present to the beauty that's around me, that's a sense of the spirit that I'm experiencing. Or uh, if uh, I'm speaking to another person and I'm truly present in the conversation with them, then I'm experiencing it as a spiritual experience. You know, Albert Einstein once said, there are two ways in which you can live your life. One way is as if nothing is a miracle. The other way is as if everything is a miracle. That's living spiritually. So going back to the metaphor of indirectly pursuing happiness, if I wake up in the morning and say, I want to bring more meaning and purpose to my life, to what I'm doing, or I'm going to be more present, whether it's in a conversation or whether it's by doing meditation or whether it's when I pray, these are indirect ways of increasing happiness. Okay. Dice, a ver, voy a desmenuzar cada una de estas claves, empezando por el bienestar espiritual, y vamos conversándolo para que entiendan qué quiero decir cuando digo buscar la felicidad de manera indirecta. El bienestar espiritual, eso se puede dar de muchas maneras. Se puede dar a lo mejor cuando ustedes rezan en una mezquita, eh, en un templo, en una iglesia, eh, cuando conectan con, con Dios o con ese poder supremo. Eh, pero también se puede dar fuera de la religión. Cuando ustedes sienten con toda claridad el sentido de propósito en su vida, cuando le encuentran sentido a lo que están haciendo, eso también es una forma de ser espiritual. Por ejemplo, en el trabajo, cuando encuentras sentido de propósito en lo que haces, en cuando le encuentras un sentido profundo a la diferencia que puedes hacer en tu vida, en la vida de alguien más, eh, cuando encuentras también sentido de propósito en tus relaciones, eh, o cuando, por ejemplo, decides ser mindful, y ya saben que se habla mucho hoy en día del mindfulness, eh, que es simplemente tomar la decisión consciente de estar presente en la conversación que estás teniendo con una persona, en lo que estás haciendo en ese momento en tu trabajo, en disfrutar el día como lo estás viviendo, en apreciar lo que está a tu alrededor y, y de verdad tomar de forma consciente el estar presente. Bien decía Albert Einstein que hay dos maneras de vivir la vida. Una, creyendo que absolutamente nada es un milagro y la otra, es creyendo que absolutamente todo es un milagro. Entonces, la espiritualidad, eh, como decidas vivirla de manera religiosa, de manera mindful, eh, de manera de, de sentido de propósito, es una manera indirecta de acercarte a ser una persona más feliz. Yo creo que simplemente... Porque cuando estás más presente, estás más conectado. Y cuando estás más conectado, tienes a lo mejor otra perspectiva de, también de apreciación de las cosas, porque sí te tomas el tiempo para ver y sentir y reconocer lo que hay, lo que sí hay. Um, so I said something else in Spanish, and, and um, correct me if I'm wrong. I'm thinking that the reason why if you are spiritually connected and well and either it's religion or a sense of purpose or you deciding to live everything right here right now then you are a more connected person and if you're a more connected person and you're more in touch with yourself and your surroundings you tend to be more appreciative And to recognize everything you're living and everything that's happening around you from a different perspective. Yeah, that, that is exactly right. You know, um, Daniel Goleman, the psychologist, calls our age the age of distraction. 
Um, and the fact that we are constantly distracted, in other words, not connected, means that we pay a very high price. Because if you think about it, we have, again, not everyone, but as a society, we have more opportunities than, uh, than uh, ever before. Yes. You now you think about the per, you know the access to great music and the access to beautiful art and the access to other people um and again not everyone but the people who have it very often fail to make the best of it why because of distraction why because we're not truly connected yeah so that has to be a first step in uh, in in finding happiness reconnecting to present moment experiences, reconnecting to present, reconnecting to each other, of yes, course. Yes, yes. Dice, 100% entiendo lo que dices. De hecho, Daniel Goldman, otro, otro gran escritor, dice que estamos en la era de la distracción. Y si se ponen a pensar y nos comparamos con la vida que tuvieron nuestras mamás, nuestras abuelas, bisabuelas, eh, estamos más... Tenemos la oportunidad de estar más conectados que nunca. Tenemos la oportunidad y el acceso a cosas increíbles que antes no existían. A la música, al arte, a, tan, a la gente, a tantas cosas allá afuera que desafortunadamente la gran mayoría que tiene acceso a esta riqueza eh, que existe no están conectados, no están presentes y pierden la enorme oportunidad de verdaderamente eh, sentir y estar y apreciar con lo que están viviendo. Eh, y, y, y estoy de acuerdo, yo creo que todos estamos en un rat race, you know what rat race means, and um, we're so focused on achieving and getting things done and solving problems that we lose sight of being connected and paying attention. Que estamos todos tan ocupados resolviendo la vida, operando eh, el problema, esto, el otro, coordinando y sobreviviendo, que se nos olvida conectar con lo que sí hay. So that's the first one, spiritual well-being. Now, physical well-being. Yeah. So physical well-being is about uh, the mind-body connection. It is about exercise, for example. Um, regular physical exercise, that's as little as 30 minutes three times a week. That's not that much. Has the same effect on our psychological well-being as our most powerful psychiatric medication. In fact, it works in the same way. It releases norepinephrine, serotonin, dopamine. These are the feel-good chemicals in the brain. Um, and the thing is about exercise, it helps at any age. For example, for children, it is critical for their psychological and physical development. Mm -hmm. um, go all the way up to the elderly. Research shows that if we start exercising, even if it is later on in life, it reduces the likelihood of Alzheimer and dementia by 52%. There is no drug wow. that comes even close to having this effect. So that's physical exercise as an indirect way of pursuing happiness. Mm -hmm. um, then there is also nutrition that, of course, matters. Mm -hmm. um, you know, what we eat, what we consume affects our mood, not just our physical health. Then there is the issue of uh, recovery, taking time off, whether it's a day off, like God did, or whether it's um, uh, taking, you know, 10 to 15 minutes off every two hours for recovery in order for us to be dealing with stress. So these are all ways of how the body or what we do or don't do with the body affects our mind. Yeah, we, we, we get that. We are high consumers of, of uh, simple carbs. We adore simple carbs. And that makes you feel as lousy as it gets. In the eh, long term. <laughs> absolutely. Dice, a ver, el bienestar físico. Miren, está comprobadísimo. El ejercicio 
es una de las armas psiquiátricas más poderosas que hay. Y estamos hablando de 30 minutos a la semana, digo, 30 minutos tres veces a la semana. O sea, la cantidad de norepinefrina, dopamina, serotonina que segregas, o sea, yo te diría que es el mejor antidepresivo que hay. Y es increíble. Pero la importancia que esto tiene para el desarrollo neuronal hasta de los niños. Incluso hay estudios que comprueban que aunque no hayas hecho ejercicio toda tu vida, aunque tengas 58, 60, 65, 70 años, el hacer 30 minutos tres veces a la semana baja en un 52% la posibilidad de que tú desarrolles Alzheimer's o demencia. Eso en el aspecto del ejercicio. Segundo, la comida, lo que comes, cómo te hace sentir, lo que nos metemos a la boca todos los días. Claro que tiene un impacto, obviamente, en la salud, pero tiene un impacto increíble también en el estado de ánimo. Y tercero, recuperarte. A veces, como Jesús, tomarte un día libre, si no es posible tomarte un día libre, cada dos horas hacer una pausa de 10, 15 minutos sobre todo si ustedes viven en situaciones de estrés, pero darle tiempo al cuerpo de recuperarse. Y no lo dijo tal, pero lo voy a decir yo, y eso incluye que la gran mayoría de nosotros ni siquiera dormimos bien. Y esa es la gran recuperación del cuerpo. Roncamos, tenemos insomnio, no hemos cambiado el colchón, eh, estamos enchochados. Eso también tiene un impacto. And I also added the fact that we, you know, talking about recuperation, we don't even sleep well. Either we snore, we have insomnia, we haven't changed the mattress in 15 years. We don't even sleep well. Um, that's exactly right. One of the uh, um, most significant ailments of modern age is that we don't sleep enough. And you know when that started? It started on the 31st of December, 1879. Excuse Why? me? 31st of December, 1879. Why? Because of Thomas Edison. That's when he invented the light bulb. And ever since that, then... That ruined been, us. Yeah, we have been sleeping a lot less. Uh, because before that, we used to sleep naturally. You know, when it was dark outside, we went to bed. When it was light, we went to work. Um, we were more physically active then. And uh, so technology has its upside for sure. We won't be able to, we wouldn't have been able to speak without technology. Um, many people meet through social media, all great, but we also need to uh, go back to basics, physical exercise, proper recovery. I love the, the, that fun fact, of course. Dice, <laughs> les voy a decir cuando dejamos de dormir bien. Y suficientes horas. El 31 de diciembre de 1879. Y yo, ¿por? Y dice, claro, es cuando Tomás Alva Edison inventó la luz. Antes, cuando se metía el sol, te ibas a dormir. Bueno, acuérdense de la casita en la pradera. Así era. Ya se metía el sol, ya se iban a dormir las niñas con su gorrito. Salía el sol, se despertaban. Mucha más actividad física pero también mucho más tiempo de recuperación. No, I was telling people just to remember that show. Remember Little House on the Prairie? Sure. I mean, the sun went down, they put the little bonnet on, and to bed everyone <laughs> go, no? Okay, so before we do a commercial break, let's do intellectual well-being. Mm. So intellectual well-being is an interesting one. So this interesting new research came out recently about curiosity. So we know that curiosity is very important for, uh, for success in life in general and in business in particular. You want to be a lifelong learner. We knew that. We also know that curiosity contributes to well-being because people who are curious, who are learning, who are asking questions, um, they're engaged with life. Their happiness levels go up. But here is the new research. The new research shows that people who are curious, who ask questions, also live longer. 
Hooray for me! <laughs> uh-huh. Why? Um, so, How so? So you, you, you know, uh, Martha, the, um, the, the saying that curiosity kills the cat? Yeah. Well, it turns out that it does the exact opposite for mm-hmm. human beings. It helps us live longer. But why? Because we're more engaged? Because we're exactly. more interested? And Yeah. And, you know, it goes back to the connection I made earlier between mind and body. When we are engaged with, with life, when we're interested, when we're excited a, a, about things, that also affects our physical well-being. We're more connected to life physically as well. Of course. But you know what? I'm laughing because of what you said. Because I think it was last week on the show, we were dishing out how much we hate people that are not curious and don't ask the right <laughs> questions. Like, I always have these amazing fights with my husband because he comes back from a meeting and he says, oh, you know what? I ran into such and such. And this is a guy that you met in high school and he remembers you with, you know, um, with with great thoughts and what is his name? Oh, no, I didn't ask. Excuse me? <laughs> well, did he tell you where he worked? No, I didn't ask them either. Mm. So some like, and so we were talking last week and people that never ask the right questions, they're not interested. They don't give a flying fig. They don't care. I want to know everything. I want to <laughs> know it all. That's why I think this show is so successful because I'm, so curious. Mm. Well, it will also help you live longer. So it's a exactly. win-win. Entonces, <laughs> empiezan a preguntar cuentavientes. Eh, dice, eh, hablando del bienestar intelectual, hay un estudio que dice que la gente que es curiosa, la gente que sigue queriendo aprender en la vida, que quiere seguir sabiendo que genuinamente le interesan las cosas, que son eternos estudiantes, es gente que está más enganchada con la vida. Es gente que está más interesada. Y cuando estás más interesado, estás más conectado. Y se acuerdan ese dicho que dice que la curiosidad mató al gato. Es todo lo contrario. Hay estudios que comprueban que la gente curiosa para todos los que son de mi equipo, vamos a vivir más. Claro que sí. Y aparte, la curiosidad tiene un impacto directo en tu bienestar físico. Porque si tú eres curioso, si tú eres preguntón, si estás enamorado de saber y de la vida y genuinamente interesado, eso tiene también un impacto positivo en tu salud física. Entonces, Aplauso para todos los curiosos, aplauso para todos los preguntones. Y le digo que la semana pasada estábamos riéndonos de la gente que nunca sabe nada, nunca pregunta nada. Le digo a mi marido, oye, pero ¿cómo se llamaba el güey que dices que me conoce que iba conmigo en prepa? Ah, no, no le pregunté. Bueno, ¿en qué, ¿en qué trabajaba? Ah, no, tampoco le pregunté. O sea, hay que preguntar, hay que saber, hay que aprender, hay que estar interesado y curioso porque eso les va a alargar la vida. Los siguientes dos puntos, el bienestar relacional y el emocional, Coltán Ben Shahar, regresando en W Radio. Estamos de regreso en W Radio en una conversación súper interesante, entendiendo que la felicidad se busca de manera indirecta. No es quiero ser feliz, voy a ser feliz, voy a cambiar mi actitud para ser feliz. No es así. Estamos con el máster de la felicidad. Tal Ben Shahar, autor, conferencista. O sea, el curso donde todo el mundo se apuntaba y todo el mundo quería ir en la Universidad de Harvard era el que daba él de psicología positiva. Y estamos hablando de las cinco claves más poderosas para alcanzar la felicidad. El bienestar espiritual, el bienestar físico, el bienestar intelectual, que si se perdieron la primera hora, rescaten en mi podcast. Y vamos con la cuarta y la quinta, que es el bienestar relacional. Relational well-being, tal. I don't know why I think you sort of understand Spanish, because when I say things like you nod and make faces, 
Like you get my Spanish, don't you? Yeah, I, I, I do understand. You know, when, when I was growing up, my father said to me, Tal, learn how to speak Spanish. It's very important. And you know, when your father tells you something and you're a teenager, you don't listen. Yeah. And now I regret it. But I, <laughs> but I do understand. <laughs> That's great. So relational well-being. Yeah. Um, relationships are the number one predictor of happiness. Now, here is the interesting thing about what the research shows. It doesn't matter relationships with whom, meaning it can be relationship with a romantic partner of uh, 10 years or 50 years. It can be family relationships. It can be friends whom you're really close to. It can even be colleagues. The key is that you're in a relationship where you are supporting and being supported. So relationships are the number one predictor of, uh, of happiness. And you know, interestingly, they're also the number one predictor of health. So, um, you know, of course, exercise matters for health a lot. Of course, nutrition matters a great deal, but relationships matter even more. Once again, pointing to the mind body connection. Now within relationships, what's very important to emphasize is uh, kindness. And generosity. Because um, what we know, and we know it from personal experience, and there's a lot of research on it, is that when we give, we receive. So giving charity, or giving kindness, or listening to someone, which is a form of giving, these are all ways of increasing levels of happiness for the person who receives our gift and for ourselves, the giver. Yeah. Eh, dice, el bienestar relacional tiene que ver con el impacto que tiene la calidad de nuestras relaciones con nuestra felicidad. Y no importa quién sea, no importa si es tu pareja, si son tus compañeros de trabajo, si es tus amigos o la familia, pero la forma en que te relacionas con los demás es fundamental para tu nivel de felicidad. O sea, que estés en relaciones en donde te apoyen y te sientas apoyado y acuerpado y que sean tu red, pero también tú los apoyes. Y eso también tiene un impacto en la cuestión física, porque al final eh, las relaciones eh, sí, sí influyen en tu felicidad y muy importante es... Eh, que seas amoroso, la palabra kind, no estoy segura cómo se dice en español, pero que seas amable, que seas amable con los demás, que te des, que seas generoso, que ayudes, puede ser a una fundación o puede ser que ayudes a alguien más con tu cariño, con tu nobleza, escuchándolo y eso tiene un gran impacto. De hecho, en los medidores de los países más felices, curiosamente, son los países en donde las relaciones sociales son mucho más importantes. Actually, when we see like the happiness scale on the happiest countries in the world, usually the happiest countries in the world are the countries which give the utmost importance to social interaction. That's exactly right. You know, and you look at Mexico, for instance. Yeah. One of, one of the happiest countries in the world and why you don't even need research for it. You know, I land in the airport. I already feel, you know, the warmth, the generosity, the, the energy of the people. You know, you, you're a nation of huggers. Yeah. And there's actually research on hugging and how important that is for physical and mental health. Yeah. Um, so, so that is key. It's key on the individual level. It's key for a family. Um, relationships are also key for successful organizations as well as the well-being of nations. Yeah. Dice, por supuesto, es cierto, los países más felices son los países que tienen relaciones sociales eh, eh, muy, eh, pues muy pegadas. Y dice, México. México, que increíblemente, aunque ustedes no lo crean, está dentro de los países más felices del mundo. Y dice tal que, o sea, no tiene ni que investigar. 
que él aterrizando en el aeropuerto internacional de la Ciudad de México ya lo vive. Eh, la energía de la gente, la sonrisa, lo cariñosos que somos, lo cálidos. Eh, somos un país de abrazadores y está comprobado el poder que tiene el abrazo sobre el bienestar físico y emocional. Entonces, eh, el, el impacto que tienen las relaciones en tu felicidad es altísimo. Inclusive, lo ves muy claro en las empresas. O sea, las empresas que tienen equipos de trabajo, que tienen muy buenas relaciones, normalmente son empresas que son mucho más prósperas. Y por último, bienestar emocional, emotional well-being tal. Yeah, so when we talk about emotional well-being, we're talking about first and foremost, embracing and accepting painful emotions. Because when we reject painful emotions like sadness or anger or anxiety or frustration or envy, when we reject these emotions, they intensify, they grow stronger. So first, it's about accepting painful emotions. How? Whether it's by shedding a tear, crying. You know, research shows that when we cry, we release oxytocin. That's the love hormone, which makes us feel, you know, all good and cuddly inside. Uh, we release opiates. These are naturally occurring drugs which calm us. So crying is one way of expressing painful emotions. Talking about it, whether it's to a therapist or a coach or with our best friend. Claro. That's a way of expressing rather than suppressing emotion or writing about our emotions. That also contributes a great deal to our well-being. Mm -hmm. So first, it's about dealing with painful emotions. Second, how do we generate pleasurable emotions? One way is to express gratitude. You know, writing down things for which we're grateful or sharing with other people things for which we're grateful. That contributes a great deal to our happiness levels. Okay. Eh, por último, en el tema de las emociones, y esto va para todos nuestros compañeros, lo primero que tenemos que aprender a hacer es aceptar las emociones negativas. Entre más rechazas el enojo, la ira, la frustración, la tristeza, es matemático. Se magnifica. Las emociones negativas no se rechazan, se abrazan. Y se abrazan en el sentido de que si hay que llorar, lloras. No sé si sepan, pero llorar eh, segrega oxitocina, que es la hormona del vínculo, es la hormona del apego. Es la hormona que te hace querer cucharear con alguien. Eh, opioides, ¿no? Que te, que te hacen sentir mucho mejor. Eh, hablar de eso, compartirlo con tu terapeuta, con un coach, con tu mejor amigo, con tu hermano. Hablar de las emociones negativas, sacarlo de tu sistema, escribirlo, expresarlo en vez de suprimirlo. Ahora, ¿cómo generamos emociones positivas? Ser agradecidos. Escribir por lo que estás profundamente contento de tener en tu vida. Expresarlo de manera abierta. Ser una persona eh, que siente gratitud en tu vida por todo lo que tienes. Eso genera una emoción positiva y se vuelve un círculo virtuoso. Y creo que en nuestra cultura nos enseñan a suprimir las emociones negativas. No te dicen cuando eres chiquita, las niñas bonitas no se enojan. Ahora sí que enojada no te ves, te ves fea. Entonces, desde esos mensajes que les mandamos a los niños o el rechazo que le ponemos a la gente a nuestro alrededor cuando muestra una emoción negativa, no ayuda a educarnos del manejo correcto de emociones que no son necesariamente agradables. And, and I think that culturally, um, we tend to suppress and to reject people when they show negative emotions. Um, there's something very common in Latin America. When you see a child crying, people tell them, you don't look pretty when you cry. No? Mm. Or, you know, pretty girls don't cry. Or, you know, great boys don't cry. And we tend to send these messages to younger generations that being mad or being sad or being frustrated makes everybody around you uncomfortable, mm -hmm. so you'd rather swallow it. And then children 
never end up learning how to deal with their negative emotions because we as adults don't even know how to do that. Yeah, that, that's exactly right. And it's very unfortunate. And what we need to communicate to children and to ourselves is that there, is, there are no good or bad emotions. Mm-hmm. You know, saying this is a good emotion or a bad emotion or a negative emotion, it's like saying the law of gravity is good or bad. The law of gravity is a fact of nature. It's not good or bad. It's yeah. the same with emotions. Now, when it comes to behavior, that's a different story. On behavior, we can put boundaries. Emotions are legitimate. They're beyond the realm of good or bad, moral or immoral. Claro. Es que es es tristísimo, pero es cierto. Eh, No se lo enseñamos a nuestros hijos. Y dice, tú puedes cuestionar la conducta de una persona, pero las emociones... Están más allá del bien y del mal, de lo correcto, lo incorrecto, lo moral, lo inmoral. Las emociones no se cuestionan. Las emociones se validan. Punto. Y se acabó. So we have uh, three more minutes, my friend. Mm-hmm. What is the conclusion and your Good. wishes for a very happy audience? <laughs> so going back to where we started, pursuing happiness directly um, is a problem. Getting up in the morning and saying, I want to be happy. Here is how I'm going to, is a problem. But pursuing it indirectly, that's how we can find it, which means expressing gratitude, giving ourselves permission to be human, maybe writing in our journal or talking about it, investing in our relationships, asking questions, um, exercising regularly, uh, being more present, Connected. These are all indirect ways of pursuing yeah. happiness. We don't need to do it all. Choose one or two of them and apply them consistently in your life. Pues vamos a regresar a donde empezamos. La felicidad se busca de manera indirecta a través de todo esto que acabamos de mencionar. Sean más agradecidos, inviertan en sus relaciones, sean personas más presentes, sean más curiosas, hagan un poquito de ejercicio, duerman mejor y toda la lista de las cosas increíbles que nos dijo tal. And you know what also I think? Many years ago, we came on the show with this term that I called the happy spot. Hmm. And it is our obligation and duty to create happy spots in our life, hmm. to find time and put in our agenda The things that make us happy. For me, it can be gardening or mm. I love and it makes me so happy crafting or mm. organizing my closet. For somebody else, it could be playing golf or spending time with their kids or, you know, playing basketball or doing whatever. And we tend to put those things aside Because we think that what is more important and urgent is our survival mode, which is working, taking care of the family, making things happen, solving problems. And if it's, and if you don't put it in your agenda as part of, of your schedule, the things you have to do to keep in touch with yourself and connect with what makes you truly happy and feel fulfilled, it will never happen. And I always say that saying that I love that happiness is the obligation we all have to not make everybody else's life miserable. (laughs) I could not agree more. And you know, Martha, the interesting thing about these happiness spots that you're talking about, not only are they important in and of themselves, you will actually perform better. You will actually be a better parent, a better employer, an employee. You'll be a better person if you have more of these spots throughout your life. So it's a win-win for yourself and for the world around you. Claro. Es que le digo que hace mucho tiempo invitamos los happy spots y que todos tenemos una obligación de poner en nuestra agenda porque si no, no lo hace uno, no encuentras el tiempo y no le das la importancia que tiene. Espacio para esas cosas que te hacen feliz. Para mí puede ser hacer manualidades o jardinería, para alguien más jugar golf, para alguien más eh, hacer ejercicio, estar con los hijos, 
para lo que sea que te llena de felicidad. Porque al final, a mí me fascina esa definición, es nuestra obligación ser feliz para no hacer la vida miserable a los demás. Tal, it was great having you on the show. Thank you so much. Are you coming to Mexico soon? I am. I'm so excited. I haven't been in Mexico for almost three years. And uh, I'll be back uh, next week. Okay. Very excited. So where are you going to be? Can we go see you? So what's the deal? Well, I'm going to be at, a, uh, at an event with uh, uh, Fundación Televisia. Uh-huh. And um, I, will, um, I will be speaking to the very uh, generous uh, individuals who, who contribute and who give and who make our world a better place. That's fantastic. Va a estar en una conferencia para Fundación Televisa. Eh, y si ustedes quieren seguir a Tal, es Tal Ben Shahar en Twitter. Igualmente en Instagram es Happiness Studies Academy. Lean su libro, Atajos hacia la felicidad, lecciones que me cambiaron la vida, que aprendí de mi peluquero. Tal, a big kiss all the way to New Jersey. Thank you so much for sharing yourself again with our audience. Thank you very much, Martha. Take care. Bye-bye.